Hello, I'm Veronique Mandel. On tonight's show, you're going to meet a writer who is an extraordinarily compassionate healthcare worker and a songwriter who writes and sings about real life. And you'll see that we're hanging out once again in Gertrude's writing room with our good friend, Vanessa Shields. Welcome to Scribes and Songsters. Jennifer George is originally from Leamington, but is now a Windsor physiotherapist. She's written a book about Ontario's healthcare system titled Communication is Care, Nine Empowering Strategies to Guide Patient Healing. This is certainly a timely topic, and Jennifer suggests that many medical practitioners could provide a more positive impact on their patients if they listen more closely to their patients and provide more encouragement. I'm so pleased to have her here on the show. Jennifer, welcome Hello. to Scribes and Thank Songsters. You. Thanks for having me. I so enjoyed this book and particularly as a nurse myself, um, there and, and there's so much to talk about yeah. in here, but tell me a little bit about Jennifer. About me. You grew up in Leamington? Yep, born and raised in Leamington and I've since moved to Windsor a few years ago. Um, I've been working at Hotel Du Grace uh, for more than five years, so that's what's kept me here now and obviously my book. <laughs> so in uh, growing up in Leamington, um, did you, you do all your schooling in Leamington? Yeah. So my grade schooling, my high schooling, and um, I went to school at the University of Windsor. I did my undergrad here and then I moved to London to do my master's for physiotherapy. So. What, um, um, and, and I'd like to talk about how you became a physiotherapist. Um, but I, was there ever anything else you ever wanted to pursue? I've always wanted to write a book, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I honestly thought initially I was going to go into pharmacy. Yeah. And so I started to work at a pharmacy when I was in high school. And then I realized it just wasn't for me. Um, and then I got it kind of into health and fitness. So I got really intrigued by the human body and movement and how that could impact health. And um, that's what led me into physio. So I changed my... Um, my degree preference to kinesiology, and then that led to physiotherapy. Yeah. Now, you certainly had influence um, from a very special a relationship with a very special person. Yes. Tell me about your dad. My dad. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so my dad and I had a very unique bond growing up. He um, retired younger, so in his late 40s, and I was the youngest of six. So my parents had me kind of, you know, as an accident, but a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he was retired for most of my upbringing. And so him and I spent a lot of time together. And same with my mom, too. She was a seasonal worker. So I got to spend, I was the luckiest, I would say, and blessed yes. to have spent a lot of time with them both. Because that's not, uh, a, 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 it's a very unique situation. Definitely. Yeah, yeah de especially nowadays. So mm -hmm. um, he's always been our protector, our encourager, um, and always always inspired us to educate ourselves and empower ourselves and, you know, do what's right um, in our best interests, but in the interests of others, too. So he was a big advocate when it came to and that. And he's shaped uh, a lot of how you feel about what you do today. Absolutely. Yeah. He really touched my life, I think, as an adult when I became mm -hmm. a caregiver to him. Um, and I think he touched the lives of many other people more than they even knew of him. Right. We yeah. got, it's almost like we got to know him more in, when he got sick. Mm -hmm. Tell us yeah. about that, because that was an extraordinary journey. It was. It really was. So um, in 2006 is when he started to become sick. So um, we found out that he had end-stage liver cirrhosis and liver cancer, and his only option was a complete liver transplant. So they had enlisted him on the transplant um, list with our encouragement. Um, so and our prayers. <laughs> yeah, pretty much because he kept hemorrhaging and he was basically dying and time was of the essence. Mm -hmm. So we pleaded and they did some pre-op testing and things to make sure he was a candidate. But he was older than the average recipient. So there was a lot more risk involved yeah. and we knew that. How so. old was he at the time? I believe he was like 67 at the time. So yeah. Not that old. I know. But 65, I think, is typically the cutoff. I wow. guess you can say, yeah. But he, you know, 
he was otherwise healthy. He was a very strong, independent man. And this was the only thing that was holding him back from being independent, like mm-hmm. he usually was. So, um, so he, thankfully, a call came for a matching liver. And I, at the time, was living in London. And I thought it was perfect timing because I thought he could have his transplant and he could recover at my apartment and things would be great again. And that's not what happened, <laughs> um, unfortunately. So... Yeah. What were some of the things that happened to him that also influenced how you relate to your patients? Yeah, so um, I guess us in the beginning, just him advocating for himself for the transplant, um, basically saying, you know, what hope can you give me at this point? So just him voicing that and us supporting that. Um, and then during the whole state of his illness, um, just again, just speaking up and just saying how he felt, just expressing himself openly. And also my dad loved to tell stories. So people that got to know him as his healthcare providers, they they loved hearing about his life and he loved sharing that part about him, which he didn't do so much pre- prior to getting sick. So like I said, we learned more about him too. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's really important as a healthcare provider to engage with our patients about how they live day to day and not just what we see right now in front of us. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. did you feel that um, there were many times when that communication um, that of care and making sure he understood everything that was going on, that that was lacking? I did. I think partly because he had suffered a brain injury as well and there was mm-hmm. language barrier. Um but I do believe even for us as his caregivers who were, you know, there were many of us, it wasn't just me, my siblings too. And we all kind of felt like, you know, there were some barriers there and um, some fragmentation happening where we just, we never felt there was a comprehensive plan and we yeah. didn't feel sometimes as involved in that, in that decision making, mm-hmm. right? So we wanted to be more of a part of it because we knew what he yeah. wanted. And that's right? so critical. It is. It's so critical and it's so... I feel like it simplifies things in a way for us as healthcare providers if we just listen to our patients mm-hmm. and we ask questions and we engage, encourage them to engage more. I, I simply think some caregivers and patients don't realize that they can be a part of the, the care plan, right? Yeah, Rather absolutely. than have it being done to them, but be a big part of that process mm-hmm. and guide us. And that's a big statement, having things done to them. Right. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, just pro- providing medication or providing therapy. Mm-hmm. But I see that as a very collaborative um, approach, right? As and you certainly write about that uh, in the book. Um, but before we get into some of the, uh, the the wonderful things that are in here that I think everybody should read, one of the things I think everyone should read and follow is your personal note. Yeah, this is what I do. Um, So this practice energizes me for what the working week will bring. I pray my patient's weekend went well and wonder about any new patients who may come into my path. I replay the past week in my mind and determine what I will do better, what went well, and what the goals are for the week ahead. I ask myself, how will I bring my best work today? How will I enable my patients to bring their best function today? How will I guide them to start their week on an uplifting note? Yeah. Imagine if everyone started their day yeah. asking those questions. Yeah. And no matter what your profession is, whether you're teaching or you're a nurse or a physiotherapist or a doctor, yeah. so critical. And I read that every morning. <laughs> I read wow. my personal note every morning. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll be reading it a lot more often, I can tell you. <laughs> um, and the, the title, Communication is Care, is, is profound, but it should be normal. Right. It's simple, but it's not so simple. It's Mm -hmm. probably one of the hardest things that we have to do in healthcare is communicate, but yet it brings everything together. And if it's lacking, despite the medication provided, the therapy provided, everything kind of falls short or falls apart. And it causes, in my opinion, unnecessary stress Mm -hmm. on patients and families. Why do you think it's so difficult for the the medical world to grasp that communication piece because my uh, understanding is that there's not a whole lot of that taught in medical schools. Yeah, but that's what I believe. And I believe 
if it is taught, I believe we need to do a little bit more observing. I, I would love for, to see clinical placements in the future to be not hands-on, but to be just observational and to kind of gain a greater emotional sense of what's happening with, with patients and the interactions with providers and how that impacts healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I definitely agree. The book has nine empowering strategies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you to list them. Yes. And then we'll talk about them. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, so the first one is define and align your purpose. Practice with compassion and empathy. Listen presently and completely. Guide from a place of integrity. Empower patients to be their own advocates. Focus on solutions, not barriers. Create a safe therapeutic environment. Prevent unnecessary conflict. And reflect and grow with impact. <laughs> If everybody followed that, the healthcare system would be quite wonderful, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I flagged uh, a Let's bunch of that. things. <laughs> <laughs> faith. Yes. You talk about faith. Yes, I talk a big part about that. Yes. Um, it was a big part of my dad's healing, we believe, his doctors believe. Mm -hmm. um, my mom is the one that kind of was our anchor, though. She uh, kept faith um, we had mementos in my dad's room because we went through a lot of roller coasters of emotions, right? At one point we were told, I shouldn't say told, but we were recommended to take my dad off life support because he had no neurological activity. So we went into mourning at that point mm -hmm. thinking he was dying or he was dead. Yeah. Um, but the next day started to show signs and obviously that led from like like led into his healing. That was probably the first part about it. And my mom just kept faith and we just kept protecting his energy because we were questioned a lot. Um, we were asked why we did this and why are you doing that? Like, why are you keeping him alive when maybe he won't be able to talk again or know who you are? Nobody really knew. And so we held on to the uncertainty with faith. Um, yeah, that he would eventually come home. Yeah. What kind of response are you getting to your book? Great response. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm getting um, really good feedback from clinicians. I'm getting people sending me excerpts from my book and how it relates wow. to a clinical scenario. Um, but I'm also getting really good feedback from entry level providers that are coming in and there's, it kind of enlightens them. And they're really getting it. Yeah, they're running with it. And, you know, it's broadening, I think, their outlook on the profession that they're getting into. So I think it's um, one of the most critical books in healthcare, personally. Wow. And congratulations. Thank and what's you. next? What's next? Um, I'm hoping to do some mentorships with students, providers on the impact of compassionate communication. Mm -hmm. But I hope to support the community and create workshops and lead perhaps organizations and uh, yeah, facilitate the importance of uh, positive communication. And I'm hoping to join that conversation on, you know, converse on communication and having an impact. So, Please do. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank Likewise. you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Please do pick up a copy of Jennifer's book. Whether you're a healthcare worker, um, a present caregiver, or you want to prepare yourself should you need medical care in the future. Coming up, I'll have a chat with singer, songwriter Karen Morand. But first, let's listen to her music. Here she is with When the Smoke Clears. Pass on the cigarettes Let's clear the air of stale beer and raw regrets Open the window and see if the sun still shines we'll Check out our scars, you show me yours And I'll show you mine Where have you been? Where are you now after the had it all now it seems so small after unraveled then will you be my dear we'll see what's left after the smoke clears Ooh. walk out that door leave that drama behind head for the hills take back your peace of mind Run out of pavement, ride the gravel road To take a look around this 
old world, you gotta take it slow. Where have you been? Where are you now after the rambling? You had it all, now it seems so small after unraveling. Well, ooh, eat my dear, let's see what's left after the smoke clears. Windsor songwriter Karen Moran delivers her home-cooked songs with warm vocals simmering with heart and home. Karen's songs celebrate the joys and sorrows of real life with confidence, encouragement and love as its foundation. During the first two seasons of Scribes and Songsters, we featured two of Karen's music videos. And now in our third season, we thought we'd present her music, but also have her come in and have a chat about her music and her life. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you. We've been uh, really enjoying having your music on the show for the last couple of seasons. Oh, thanks. And so it's, it's sort of nice to see you in person. Mm. Um, what's your earliest memory of singing? Um, probably from just very young, uh, singing at home with my family, singing at church. We would sing in the car which is kind of sounds cheesy, but that's no. what we would do. And we'd, so we would all sing in, you know, four-part harmony. And so, yeah, music's always been a part of my life. What kind of music were you influenced by? You know, were, were there particular um, genres or, or particular musicians you preferred to listen to or listen to more? Well, I mean, it's changed throughout the years, right? My my dad was is a very eclectic um, music consumer, and so I think a lot of he had a lot of jazz on, but then he would have blues and rock, and he would take us to concerts, and so I hmm. think that was kind of early influence. But I've always gone through phases, like you know, like people do, and so you know the the raunchier stuff when you're in high school, and then uh, when I met my now husband, it was kind of hillbilly, you know, music, and uh, so I've kind of gone all over the map with uh, my influences. Yeah. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Mississauga. And, and what brought you to Essex County? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, uh, I met my husband there as well, but he's from Windsor, and uh, after we were married a while, um, I decided to go back to school, and uh at the time, there were only two schools in Ontario that had the um, music therapy program, and University of Windsor was one. And because we, because he had roots here, we thought that was a natural fit, mm -hmm. and uh, we just and it we took root as well. So, wow! Yeah. Tell me about uh, music therapy. Well, it's I think it's it's like it sounds. It's using music to help people in a broad sense. Um, it's got many different applications. I think we I think everyone senses 
that that there's something about music yeah. that is healing, that is uh, transcendent, that there's something special about it. I mean, we use it to pick ourselves up or sometimes mm -hmm. we use it to feel even sadder. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> depress <laughs> ourselves all to heck. <laughs> uh, and I think that's why they use it in, you know, in all kinds of mm -hmm. medium because it's powerful. So it's using it with intention to help people with uh, certain therapeutic goals. Mm -hmm. When did you realize that you were going to make a living making music if you do. <laughs> yes, and I do. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think music therapy was the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. And um, although I don't practice formally as a therapist now, um, it was probably when I was about 40, I decided I really wanted to be a working musician. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was new to writing and uh, I've always played instruments. So I grew up playing piano and then I picked up guitar when I went to the University of Windsor. And um, I just thought, I think I can make this happen. Um, I've learned over the years that, you know, it's, uh, it make, unless you want to be, you know, on the road all the time, mm -hmm. which doesn't suit me, um, that you need to have multiple streams of income. So I teach music and, uh, and then I, and I write and I co-write and I perform and, uh, and right now I do some work at my church in a, in a paid position doing music there. So it's, uh, you know, it's what you need to do to, uh, yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah, to make a living. Um, do you play um, a lot of venues around the area or do you play out of town? Uh, I do both. I just yeah. got back from a tour, um, my first kind of big tour to the East Coast. Um, but generally I stick around town. I play uh, solo and with my band Bosco. We're a trio. And we play cafes and wineries and, you know, yeah. Let's just go back to that uh, tour of the East Coast. Where yeah. did you go? We uh, Well, we started in Kingston and went east and went as far east as uh, Mahone Bay, which is kind of like where Oak Island is, the famous <laughs> pirate <laughs> treasure town. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, so we kind of stuck to the west end of, the, uh, of Nova Scotia. And uh, it was wonderful. I met so many amazing people. And uh, yeah. There's... How did the Nova Scotians uh, receive your music? Well, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most people were really great. There was one town. I'm not going to name it because I, you know, I want to make friends. <laughs> and uh, I, people down east seem to, they love their country music. They of course. do. They love it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this particular town, at this particular event, they really liked old you know, country music, Conway Twitty and Mel Tillis and oh, Johnny Cash. Right, and, right. And uh, I, you know, someone played before me and they, they were a hit because they did all the, they did all the hits and then they did jigs and reels <laughs> that they might as well have gone home at that yeah. point, right? It's Nova Scotia. <laughs> and then I got up and did my stuff and I lost a few people. I'm just going to say, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> what does that but, feel like? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, it, it's almost humorous in a way. In one yeah. way, it feels, I felt sad, but very quickly it's like, well, this is, this is kind of humorous and it'll make a great story. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was like, all I could hear was a slamming of lawn chairs. And I just thought, I had sunglasses <laughs> on. I was like, close your eyes, Karen, just close your eyes and sing your heart out. And, uh, and then, of course, people were walking by because it was in a park setting and they stopped and stayed. So I think we... We replace the folks that mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't their cup of tea. And we have to know that as artists, we have to learn uh, whatever your art is. It's not for, it's not going to be everyone's no. cup of tea. Do you ever use some of those stories in your own songwriting? Uh, yes, I have. I have. Yeah. And I think actually I've been thinking this week because I've been reviewing the, the trip and uh, it gave, it's given me ideas for maybe writing some additional songs because yeah it's I mean these stories um you know we can find ourselves if we can find ourselves in those stories that there's value to telling them again mm -hmm. yeah. and it doesn't matter whose story it is mm -hmm. there's always something that resonates 
with another person. Yes. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the value of songwriting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. Bosco, how long have you been with Bosco? And, and who are the, the guys? The guys are Benny Santoro. He plays a, a wooden box. It's called a cajon. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And it, it's just kind of, it's portable and it's softer than a, a full yeah. kit. Now, what's this, the history of that particular instrument? My understanding is that it's um, a, a South American percussion instrument. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so he's my, also my brother-in-law. Uh, and then the other guy is Aaron Verholst, and he plays mandolin and lead guitar. And uh, we've been together. We were talking about it last night because we had a rehearsal, and uh, we're thinking eight years, but we were all a little fuzzy on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while for us to land in this configuration, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of eight years. Uh, do you have a family, children? I do. I have a son who's 15 and a half and, uh, and an awesome husband who's very supportive. And that makes a big difference mm -hmm. for to be a working artist, for someone to, you know, be supportive in every way possible. And um, he was an awesome support on the on the tour because, you know, he would just encourage me or mm -hmm. make sure I got to places early and we were able to uh, fine tune some stuff along the way. So it was a good time. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's always nice to have that kind of comfort there when, when the folks walk out. That's right. <laughs> That's right. He helped me see the humor in it early on, actually. <laughs> you have a very uh, eclectic sound because I hear hillbilly and gospel and mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. And is that deliberate or does that just come out of you? <laughs> it, it just comes out because yeah. some people in the industry might say, you know, pick a lane, mm -hmm. just pick something and, and go with that, be known for that. But just as, why? Well, yeah. <laughs> and it just things tickle my fancy. And as my music evolves, that just I'm gravitating towards different things. Yeah. And, yeah. So what, what's next? What are you up to now? Um, well, after, you know, after the dust settles from yeah. being away, um, I have a Christmas song that I'm hoping to have out for Christmas season and uh, kind of put my roots back down in Windsor and continue to work with my trio and maybe do some teaching. Mm -hmm. I hear there's some great places in town that they have excellent writing workshops. Yes, I heard that too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck and thank, thank you, you so much. And I really appreciate your being here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, alas, alas, it's time to go. Thank you, Vanessa Shields, for having us here as your guest for the past couple of shows here in your charming little house at Willis Dead. Thank you to our wonderful guests, Jennifer George and Karen Morand. Thank you to our producer, Brian Sweet, and sound video producer, Gary Glass. Grateful thanks to Tony Toldo and the Toldo Foundation and to Neil and Tina Quaring. Grateful thanks indeed. I hope you'll come back soon for another episode of Scribes and Songsters. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Veronique Mandel.